Well, today we have on our first CEO, our first co-founder of a nationally known brand. So welcome, Bill, to the Beer Mob Podcast. Bill is the co-founder, co-founder, and uh, are you CEO? Is that your current title as well? CEO of Athletic Brewing. So we're excited to have you on, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. Cheers. It's great to see you guys. So you've had a crazy uh, last few months by the looks of it, Athletic Brewing raised its series C. Um, I believe you also had a, a child as well recently. So how is everything going in your world? How how busy and crazy has life been for you? Um, I mean, about as busy as it's always been. And uh, <laughs> Athletic has been really fun. It's like um, just the community has, it's always been so community driven as a company where like we were a product that was in many ways, like hiding in plain sight, like people wanted beer. They could drink any time of the day, anywhere. And like, we're asking for, but not asking for it. And like, I don't know, it's been crazy the whole time. Like even the thought of non-alcoholic beer and devoting your career to it was like a crazy <laughs> idea as well. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, I think a big part of the, um, appeal and well, there's a number of things that are you know lead to the success and the appeal of it. But I think a big part of it is the fact that it's craft beers and not just the typical um, I don't know like Budweiser Zero or Heineken and all, all of the really basic uh, lager beers. The fact that you guys have a bunch of different brews, uh, you know, wheat beer, IPA, uh, all sorts of different things. So maybe talk through a little bit of that strategy around. Um, the craft beer process and the quality of the product and uh, how you kind of aimed for that and and develop that uh, part of your company over time. Yeah, for sure. And it's funny, I I actually really like the Heineken Zero and the Bud Zero as well. It's like there are like different beers for different occasions. And like, I'm definitely not in the beer shaming business at all. Um, But the problem, and like those two are very recent launches. Um, Both of those Mm -hmm. were 2019 and 2020. But like before Athletic in 2018, Heineken in 2019, like there had been no activity in this category for like 30 plus years. And since like before I was born. Yeah. Probably oh, yeah. Since before you yep. were born. Yeah. And like many of the offerings, like if you look at it, it's like, oh, wow, that came out in like 1978. And like, or and there's like a lot of the products were so similar to like the Prohibition near beers in not only product, but marketing. It was scary. And, um, if you look around the grocery store, I mean, there was nothing else. Like there are no products in the Whole Foods that were there 30 years ago, except for like this one corner. And I was going through that transformation where I was just like a very normal, modern, healthy guy who wanted to wake up early, work out, feel good, go to work, but still like go to sports bars, go to nice dinners, go to work dinners and have a beer. And it, it was just so tough that like when I stopped drinking, like looking at that shelf and like realizing that was my shelf was like such a painful place to be. Um, But we really like, I'm a huge foodie. I'm a huge beer guy at heart. And like, I went to college in Vermont where like four of the pioneering craft brewers of new England were within like 20 miles of where I went to school. And so like, I went from having incredible craft beer and like falling in love with it in college to New York city where you could basically get any craft beer around the country you wanted. And then to all of a sudden go cold turkey and be like pairing like great meals or like a great like burger on a weeknight with like a soda was just so disappointing. Um, But yeah, in terms, I mean, in terms of our products though, like I can't possibly take credit for how good the beer is. Like our other co-founder, John is like a true brewmaster, um, even though he would never use those words, but he's like, a super taster has such a great palate. His recipe talent's unbelievable. And then working with him now, we have incredible brewing teams on both coasts and lab teams. And we're just like constantly iterating and fine tuning and chasing perfection. So like, yeah. I couldn't possibly stand here and tell you I'm anything but a basic <laughs> guy who loves beer, but like they are like truly masters of their craft for sure. I'm curious when you and John first set out, uh, we were both listening to like a few of your podcasts uh, starting out in your career. And you mentioned that you personally had never like brewed beer. Um, John obviously was, was well established in that area, but I'm curious as far as like, historically, you said like the, the other NA beers like hadn't really changed a whole lot since like the seventies, or I guess like Oduls in the nineties, was it, 
your idea from the start, not just to like market the beer differently, but also like what's different about the brewing process that athletic does versus those other older brands. For sure. Um, so I was kind of like dug into like the category, the industry and like craft brewers are incredible. And like, there's so much more science and exact preciseness in beer than like, like there's this image of brewers with beards and like, they don't do themselves the justice of like how talented and how scientific they are. And um, so my assumption was that if these technologies worked, this incredible brewing community would be using those technologies to make awesome beers. Um, and so we kind of started with the baseline just in how the technologies worked, that it wasn't possible to make great craft beer using them because like, just because they're too industrial, too aggressive on the, products to really maintain the nuances of fermentation and the esters and the aromas and all the delicacies. So we started with the baseline that we wanted to come up with our own method. And I'd been reading a lot of textbooks and was delusionally confident that I had a method. And I brought that to John and John was like the first person out of like hundreds that said, I think this actually might work. And to a point where like neither, like, so John had brewed plenty of beer. I had never brewed beer. We had this idea of how to make non-alcoholic beer. And like, it's crazy that that was enough for him to move across the country and start home brewing, <laughs> like, and trying to make non-alcoholic beer. Like it's, yeah, it's really equally as crazy on his part as my part for sure. <laughs> if not more. How, how did you originally meet John or seek John out? How, how did that original encounter happen? through a lot of rejection it uh <laughs> yeah it was i would go to like beer conferences with like ten thousand people and try to network okay. for someone to work on non-alcoholic beer with and like there was less than zero interest and by the time i had met john i'd been posting on message boards like anyone looking to found a really innovative company and it would have nowhere like non-alcoholic beer would not be in anything and uh john was really the only person who saw the potential in the idea and like the potential for positive impact the the idea of a beer you could drink any day, any time, not only Friday and Saturday night, but like Tuesday night, like Taco Tuesday, Meatless Mondays, whatever, like this is your food pairing for whenever. And after you have that beer, you can also go back and resume life and like drive your kids somewhere or whatever. And um, as a, as a John had two young kids um, and uh like he saw that potential in like, yeah. he was like, Oh my goodness. Like I could enjoy craft beer, hang out with my kids after be wake up feeling totally fine. And to his credit too, like as a guy who loves cooking and recipes and like a scientific challenge, he really just like wanted the challenge also, I think. Yeah. So, so you mentioned John took the, took a risk and moved across the country and he had two kids as well. So how did, how did the company start just from a financial standpoint? Were you kind of funding it with all of your years, you know, working in New York city as a trader and using your savings essentially to fund it at first, or how did that, how did that look? And how, yeah, convincing John and, you know, you taking the, the leap of faith as well. And I think your wife also played a part of that kind of convincing you to do it, but yeah. How did, how did that look? How did the structure look to, to start off? Yeah. My wife was very on board and definitely our biggest uh, encourager enabler if you will like definitely push me out the door my old job um we kind of uh like put our heads together and we we're like what exact amount of money do we need to live for two years and then like we'll dedicate this to the company um and then also raise some money from some investors and friends and family and um it, that was a whole nother series of rejections but like we didn't have any product or anything at that point so like everyone who wrote checks to support athletic was just investing in the idea of better non-alcoholic beer. That makes sense. And what was the very first beer that you guys went to market with? Uh, so we homebrewed the golden ale over and over again, because okay. it was like so crisp and clean and like there weren't a ton of hops to like hide any faults or anything. So we had iterated that beer probably 30 times at least before we even wow. brewed the first IPA. Um, and then, um, yeah, Run Wild and Upside Dawn were our first like two beers that we really like dialed in over and over again. Um, yeah, after a while, I was just begging John to brew some IPAs. So like we, <laughs> I hadn't had an IPA in like five years and was dying to try a non-alcoholic IPA. And um, 
it was even like batch number eight. I was like, this is starting to taste great. And John was like, that's not even close to a beer. <laughs> yeah. So. I'm curious. So, so John moves uh, across the country to kind of like put it, put the money on the, on the table and start this company. And it sounded like you two, uh, you knew each other, you had conversations, but certainly weren't like extremely well acquainted, like longtime friends. I'm curious, like how that relationship has gone throughout the years. Yeah. I mean, we didn't really know anything about our personal lives when we started home brewing together in an empty warehouse. So it was like nine months just around Gatorade jugs, like talking about <laughs> anything and everything. And like definitely sure got to know each other really well over that time. And yeah. since then, um, both of us are like pretty chill operators. Like, pr- like things go wrong every day. Like things break, like something totally unexpected happens. Um, and yeah, neither of us have ever like lost, like lost our temper, or raised our voices or anything. And, um, it's awesome. We're just like very totally complimentary in skill sets too. So, um, there's yeah. no like stepping on toes or anything, but yeah. ultimately very just like driven to it, like make great products that make people happy. They're positive on people's health and happiness and like it all kind of like the more beer we sell, the more positive impact we have on people's health and the more charitable we can be. And so it all kind of like flows in a nice direction. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, you've, you've grown very quickly for sure. I would, I would be willing to bet that pretty much all of our listeners, pretty much everyone in the athletic world, or at least in the endurance sports world, you know, running specifically, I don't know of anyone who hasn't heard of athletic. And I think a lot of people have tried it at this point. Um, so now, now you're at a lot, lot larger scale. So how do you, and John, like, what is, what does your day to day look like? Are you how, like, how do you divide responsibilities? Is John still kind of overseeing all of the new recipes and the, the brewing process and your, I don't know, kind of on financial side and the other pieces, like how, do, how do you guys uh, divvy that up and what does your day to day look like? It's so funny to hear you operate with the assumption that like every listener would know what we're about. Like, cause <laughs> I'm so used to like standing at a booth and having people come up and like, be like, not alcoholic beer. What? And like, <laughs> Then like immediately comes like a joke yeah. that like takes out my kneecaps. And, um, <laughs> well, I think I think Molly, the Molly Seidel being you know one of the spokespeople for it, for at least in the running world and then for, for sure, yeah. crushing the Olympics. I think just in the last six months that has really gotten the message out to the the running world, the track and in distance running world. Mm-hmm. At least from my perspective, agreed. Yeah, uh, yeah, and it's uh, so like we uh, yeah we started from definitely nothing and like for the first year, like every weekend I would go and do multiple events and hand out like 500 beers at a finish line, go to somewhere else, go to the tap room. Um, and we really built our community, like literally beer by beer and like people making a joke, tasting the beer and being like, Oh my goodness, waving over their friends. And like, then there's a group of eight people drinking our beer and, um, like the community and the ambassador community and our customers really built like from scratch and like, we still like keep in regular contact with so many of our longtime customers, either through our ambassador team or Facebook groups and stuff. And um, yeah, Molly was an incredible story. She was like on our amateur ambassador team, like a great athlete, no doubt, but Mm -hmm. like, like unheralded in a lot of ways where she was a barista and hadn't really like run marathons and been recognized. And when she was like, halfway through running the u.s olympic trial and like the head of our ambassador program is like calling all of us and being like oh my goodness turn on the tv one of our ambassadors <laughs> is like in second place and it was just such a cool moment and like such an example of like someone in our community like mm-hmm. exactly who we were trying to speak to like actually like playing out in the world and then like meeting more people in the community and that was so great like how it all came together and um yeah but, yeah it's it's just so funny to like hear this assumption of people like knowing what we're talking about (laughs) such a far cry from where we were just like two years ago (laughs) yeah and i the first the first time i tried athletic i think was in 2019 um just a friend a friend uh suggested that i try it so i guess exactly what you want word of mouth he was we were training for a marathon together and he was like hey there's this beer that's like actually good that you can drink, you know, and not mess up your running. Uh, you should try it. And so I tried it then. And at that time it was, 
I don't remember exactly how many beers you had, but not many. I got the the IPA and the the golden and then looking, you know, looking again at the website this year, kind of re reigniting my interest in athletic. I know that you guys have a bunch of different ones. Now you're getting in like, uh, you got a hazy and um, I noticed like a blackberry uh, flavored uh, wheat beer. So ha- is the, is the intent to just continue to expand the portfolio and continue developing new recipes? And um, I know that you're also in the seltzer game now too. So what is, yeah, what is from a product perspective, how are you thinking about that? Like roadmap on, you know, ex- expanding on the brands that you are the, the, you know, the flavors that you already have, but then also adding new recipes and other product lines entirely. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough balance where there's a, uh... And there is such a dearth of options out there. So we do feel a role of like needing to get everyone every style sometimes. Um, But we really try to make most readily available our most popular, most highly awarded beers and then make sure they're available at stores. So like people can always get run wild, like because it's it's like our favorite beer and like it's won the most awards and people ask for it the most. Um, But so we want to keep that like that's, But then also we have our e-commerce platform where like, so in any given retail year, we have 10 or 12 beers available in stores throughout the year total. Um, But like our e-commerce platform gives us a great opportunity. And like we own and operate both of our own facilities. So Mm -hmm. we have brewing systems from three and a half barrels, seven barrels, 20 barrels, 40 barrels, 100 barrels, 200 barrels. Like, so we can make all those different size batches in the brew house and then we also have 400 and 600 barrel fermenters they go into as well so we can make anything from like 30 cases to upwards of 8,000 cases in a single batch and um uh or uh 10,000 cases in a single batch but uh yeah on our e-commerce platform this year we've released over 47 beers so far year to date and like I'm drinking a grapefruit Rattler right now, just because I've like happened to be in the mood for it, looking at my fridge. But it's really fun to like most afternoons. I have one of our three coffee beers, like for an afternoon caffeine boost, and yeah, it's really fun to be able to like make beers for any occasion or any meal, really too. And like that's something that just like never existed in non-alcoholic beer. Even even with like uh, traditional beer, I feel like it's kind of hard to get a mixture of those tastes because like after like a few you're like oh I'm kind of like full and a little drunk so (laughs) yeah it's it's not like worth it Um, yeah I'm I'm curious from uh from like a distribution perspective what percent of sales go through the website and what goes through um storefronts yeah it's uh there well the I guess there's a lot of people who like either buy things online or buy things in stores. And then there's mm-hmm. probably like 20% who cross over and do both. Yeah. Um, so both are great channels and we consider it omni-channel and actually where like online's the strongest is where we're also the strongest in store because it's such a great marketing channel. Um, yeah. But yeah, in any, any given year, um, a little over 50% is in our wholesale channel and that grows up as we, that grows as we get into bigger and bigger retailers too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, yeah. It, it seems like being able to distribute, you know, nationally on your e-commerce side is like a huge bonus for, for you being an NA beer versus, you know, obviously buying alcohol. There's a lot more legal uh, restrictions around that, but especially with the pandemic, it seems like that channel and that ability to sell on e-commerce would be just a huge advantage that you would have over, you know, I guess, well, maybe, maybe comp- your direct competition can sell their NA beers online too, I guess. But, but uh, I would have, my guess would be that that grew a lot over the last, you know, year or two years during the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, our, uh, pretty much everyone had disregarded that channel and said they don't really need it because they can do stores. And mm-hmm. we had just been iterating like since 2018, where I was like packaging every package myself at the end of the day. Um, like we'd been making that customer experience and building those systems every year and like learning a lot of painful lessons at a small scale. And so by the time the pandemic hit, we were shipping thousands of packages a day anyway out of our own buildings. And um, so it like it was ready to go and the infrastructure was built and our customer base knew where to get it and like knew that if they couldn't go to the store, they could get there. And also into like different hours of the day too, like 
beers for the afternoon and like we launched day pack right like towards the middle of the pandemic too and yep. so you can like drink a seltzer any hour of the day and like it's it kind of like just like scratches a different itch and it's like for all those occasions where beer might not be permissioned or socially acceptable <laughs> or or just might not be the flavor you want at that time like the seltzer goes so many places too and it's like it's like a really fun premium twist on seltzer yeah. Yeah. We, we were talking right before we started recording. So, so beer at work is that that's an okay thing at athletic brewing all beer all day, all good. <laughs> For sure. I mean, there's no better quality testing and sensory than drinking the product and like yeah. the, we'd much rather find any faults or concerns in house that rarely happen. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, uh, it's great. We, uh, and that is how day pack came about too, is something that like with leftover hops and fruit, we were just messing around. And before we knew it, our team was drinking so much of it during the day and we were offering it for free in the tap room, just as like a water alternative. And we didn't really expect much of it. And we were just giving out so much for free. They were like, Oh, maybe this is a real product. And like, we were like doing separate <laughs> canning runs. And so it kind of got its own life of its own. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, what the e-commerce, you know, being a means of, and, and your own employees, of course, being a means of testing out new products and just seeing what like really flies off the shelf is such a perfect model to have, you know, a uh, distribution model to have in place. And it's actually funny because we, Adam and I did a, a few podcast episodes ago, we did a, like a beer tasting, a blind beer tasting where we each bought beers for the other person and wrapped them in foil. So you couldn't see what they were and tasted them. And I gave him an athletic one. Um, and I mean, he, he, he had no idea that it was a non-alcoholic beer, you know, like not, no clue. Me, it threw me for a complete loop. And I, I <laughs> definitely had, the, it was, it was just the same flavor, right? Run yeah. Wild. Yeah. I I've had it before, but it, I think you I never like, thought that I never, was, I never yeah. thought that it would be in the mix, but yeah, it was, I, I thought I gave it a pretty good review. You gave it a good review. It's just, it was just like, yeah, you don't, you can't tell the difference between no. the alcoholic and non-alcoholic. No. So it's a testament to the product for sure. <laughs> I love that. That's exactly what John said. John was like, I'll move across the country. We can homebrew as much as we want. But he was like, if the beer's not good craft beer, period, not just good non-alcoholic beer. He's right. like, we're not selling a single can of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. When you have someone reaching for the product as the preferred taste, even over an alcoholic option in some cases, I mean, then then that's a especially a, a big advantage to have in the market. So that's that's cool. So you opened up uh, pretty recently opened up your second facility in San Diego. Um, so what's, uh, again, what, what's the scale of the, of the operation now? Like how many, I don't know what people would go know by, like how many gallons of uh, beer are you guys producing and how many employees is athletic up to at this point? Um, so we have 160 teammates across the country. Okay. Um, and then our original Connecticut brewery is about 10,000 barrel capacity. Um, and about a 10,000 square foot building. Our San Diego facility that we opened uh, like a year and a half ago is 180,000 barrels and about 80,000 square feet. Um, and we're building another Connecticut brewery now that'll open middle of next year that's um, about double that in square feet and can ultimately make about three times as much beer. Um, so the new Connecticut brewery will be about almost 50 times the scale of the original one. Wow. That's super impressive. So, uh, seems like, I guess a couple of things come to mind. So seems like hockey stick growth pretty <laughs> is, is underway. Yeah. So is the, you, you recently raised the series C, um, from, I guess just curious out of like a, a from a business model perspective is the goal to, uh, just continue to fund, you know, high growth, um, as warranted, or do you have hopes of like not needing additional funding? Uh, how do you, how do you think about the future of the, the business side of things? Yeah, most of our funding has been for like construction and the buildings and to support mm -hmm. future growth. Um, but yeah, when we, um, uh, like raised our first round with, we had no product, it, our investors are people very on board with the products and the mission and the impact and, I don't think there are high return expectations. So <laughs> it's, yeah, we're definitely in build mode. Um, still definitely laying the bricks for our future and like building the community. And um, again, the hockey stick growth, we've been really lucky in that like 
in our original business model, we knew that like 50% of adults don't really drink. And most adults who do drink, drink in really specific times of the week. Um, we knew that like we could potentially open up the beer, wine and spirits world to populations and times of the week that it had never touched before right. or that it used to touch and no longer touches in the modern day um, with like people so connected to their phones and these tailwinds of like health, mindfulness, like just better for you. Like if it's plant-based milk, plant-based meat, organic, everything, we think this is so much in the trend of those things. And mm -hmm. a few lucky things have also been happening concurrently with like, like so much, so many people like have like fitness wearables these days, like whoop yep. bands, Fitbits, <laughs> iWatches. Yeah. Exactly. I them both too. And, um, it, like you can measure every variable of your life, especially during the pandemic where a lot yep. of variables have been taken away. And it's so clear that like, oh, like actually Whoop does an incredible job with the content on their website, but it's like they speak to um, like the impact alcohol has on recovery and things like that. And it, a lot of elite athletes have found our products organically. Um, like it definitely does doesn't surprise me to hear like athletes of your caliber all know about it in the circles because like alcohol affects sleep alcohol affects like you still tear the same muscles in training but if you have alcohol after like you don't recover and make gains on top of that and um there i've seen stats that like um the impact of like drinking after a workout lasts four days longer than it otherwise would have. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and like the impact on sleep is unbelievable. So like, we're, we're so fortunate to have like all these movements of information technology moving. So like firmly at the tailwind of our business since we launched, which have all definitely helped it. Um, but a lot of our elite athletes have found us organically. Um, like Molly was an example who like came to us and was on our ambassador team. But like Ben Hoffman, the elite Iron Man, he was drinking our beer for a year before he reached out. He's like, I'm just posting about this on my Instagram. I'm talking to all my friends about it. Like, could maybe we do a sponsorship deal? And like, <laughs> I start to get credit for this. And, um, but yeah, it definitely, um, I think it like kind of starts with like the most elite athletes in their community, like you guys. And then like everyone looks to those people in their community as like, well, that's the health expert. That's the performance expert in my community. And like kind of takes the nod from there. But um, it also like, I think people just want to feel good and be somewhat responsible, but still have the social occasion. Mm -hmm. Like um, humans have been drinking beer for thousands of years. And like when you crack the beer and kind of what you were just talking about, like you want the hops, you want the malt, you want the associations, but like, you're not there for the alcohol that hits you like three hours down the line. Well, right. in plenty of occasions you are also, but like, it, uh, right, right. like, like so many of my favorite beers are like when I first get to a bar and I see a friend I haven't seen in a while or like, exactly. it, it has nothing to do with alcohol. There's everything to do with just having something in your hand and being social or seeing your family and stuff. So, right. Yeah. We're, it's funny like that, uh, a lot of the facets of like beer outside of just the alcohol. Uh, Chris and I actually had an idea to do like an ASMR video for beer because it's like, <laughs> there's like so many things that happen that I'm like, Oh man, it like makes a little noise. And like when the first yeah. drop like hits your tongue and that, no. Like, yeah. There's a lot of positive associations with, oh, with beer uh, exactly, in general exactly. and it's not, yeah, it's not necessarily the feeling of the alcohol or, or if it is, it's usually you, you never, you, typically you don't want the feeling of, you know, five servings of alcohol and especially how it feels the next day. Like, I don't think anyone wants to feel how it feels the day after drinking yeah. alcoholic beer. So, um, so yeah, it, it really is the, uh, the vibe of it all, I guess, for lack of a better word that, that really, and, and like you said too, right before we started recording the, you know, having a beer at work in the afternoon a, a non-alcoholic beer, just, just even one sip of that, just trigger something in your brain to be like, Oh, I'm in a good mood. I'm, you know, having, having a good day. Like I'm not, and it's the same with like drinking decaf coffee for me. Like I don't necessarily, the caffeine does something of course, um, to your body, but even in having an afternoon decaf coffee is like just enough for my brain to say, Oh, like be alert, wake up, you know, start focusing on something. And you like 
kind of have the placebo effect of it for, you know, for lack of a better word that you yeah. just, just by, you know, all the associations that you make in your brain with, with the product. For sure. Yeah. It's definitely that like, um, almost like the grandmother's cookies effect where you like, yeah. if you like smell freshly baked cookies in a bakery, it like takes you back to your childhood or like, there's so much more going on with the hops and the malt that like, yeah. it's like, Oh, I'm with family. I'm with friends. I'm relaxing. And like, it definitely helps take that stress off. Um, yeah. So like you mentioned uh, 50% of adults don't really drink and even, you know, more than that really only have one drink a week or, or mm -hmm. not, you know, they aren't, they aren't drinking every day. I'm wondering like what, do, like off the top of your head or just like information that you have at hand, what's been like the impact for people who aren't drinkers that have found athletic brewing? even if it's just like anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, we get like waves of emails and like, it definitely adds up to a picture over time. Um, so I'd say uh, a, a majority of our customers do drink at least from time to time, which okay. we think is probably like 70, 80%. Um, but we have had all sorts of stories where people have like cut down their drinking a lot or like are so excited to find a good weekday beer that like, they can drink a lot more of and feel not guilty about, or um, we do get like really touching emails too um, about people who stopped drinking or who had tried to stop drinking in the past, failed and failed and failed. And finally it stuck when they had a good offering to stick with it and like yeah. go out socially and not feel awkward. And we get a ton of those emails or people who are like suffering through some sort of medical condition. Um, and like we're able to start drinking beer again and are so psyched. And um, so like the emails are really all over the gambit from like, like just positive impact on people's health to like really being able to enjoy social situations, family situations, or like continue with their sobriety. So um, yeah. it's an amazing community. Yeah. I feel like I really notice. Um, I think actually last year uh, kind of like heat of pandemic, uh, it was sometime after Thanksgiving, but like before New Year's, I was just like be, being home all the time. And like, I think I'm probably with the majority of Americans that like drank more during the pandemic. It was mm -hmm. very nice to like have a beer that was still like good tasting to, to be able to drink and like kind of have a period in between. Like, yeah. I, I assume most holidays for people are, are like, around alcohol. So for me, it was a, a nice thing to have. Exactly. Yeah. Go, going back to the, you know, notable people being behind the brand. So when you were first fundraising for athletic, you, you've mentioned that you had a lot of, a lot of no's until you finally got some yeses. Um, but now you've, you have a collection of people that are very notable people that are investors in the company um, between the Tom shoes, founder, uh, Lance Armstrong, um, who, uh, JJ Watt, is that what you JJ said as well? Watt. Yeah. So, yep. so yeah, how, I mean, that, I guess that kind of just, you know, serendipity, whatever you want to call it, it kind of fell into place, but then, uh, it seems like you're getting those, these types of people to be the ones that want to continually invest. And, in, you know, now you are at a scale where people have heard of you and you're still getting, um, actual, you know, athletes or voices in the sports world that are backing the brand. So, uh, I guess, yeah, maybe talk a little bit about that, uh, the initial funding process. And then, uh, you know, now is that part of the strategy to really focus on the, the people that are notable in the sports world? Uh, I mean, so that's really just happened organically. Um, most of those people just reached out. Um, like Blake Mikoski, the founder of Tom Shoes, who actually was like a business idol of mine before, mm -hmm. um, he just reached out on our info email. And like, I was at home having dinner and I was like, Oh my goodness. I know that. Name. Um, and, uh, Nuts. Like Blake kind of wrote the book on social entrepreneurialism where it's like, um, it is possible to have a huge positive impact, but make a profit also. And like, I definitely took cues from that in our two for the trails program where we donate 2% of all sales to trail and park cleanups. And the whole point of that is to like, have it hard coded in our DNA, like our positive impact on the environment, like from day one. Mm -hmm. And I knew if we like tried to get out the door without it, um, 
like it would be so hard to put it in afterwards. Right. And so like every investor I've ever met with has like put that into Excel and been like, this gets unbelievably huge as the company grows. And like, I'm like, that's the point. And like, like this year we're going to do almost a million dollars in trail and park cleanup donations um, across like 38 different States. And um, so like Blake has been super helpful in that and find like founding a meaningful business. But uh, yeah, people, a lot of our celebrity investors have found us organically. Um, Darren Ravel was one of the first, like, he was one of the first people I said the idea to out loud at a conference and wasn't like, you're out of your mind. He was like, that's a good idea. He's like, can you keep me up on that? And he's introduced us to some of our athletes and then a fair amount have found us organically. Yeah. It's kind of, I feel like maybe, and this is just like hindsight, uh, 2020, but like, it seems like, the path that seltzer water took would be like an obvious, um, I don't know. It seems like it would imply that something like this would be successful, but yet you still had like a ton of naysayers. What were, what were some other things that you thought were like very obvious, um, pointers to like this future success that like you didn't think anyone else saw? Yeah. I mean, I had never thought about going into the business of non-alcoholic beer for sure. Like I had also only ever talked about non-alcoholic beer to make fun of it before I (laughs) actually went into it for a living. Um, But as I like wanted that product in my life, I started to just run Google surveys and like out of a thousand people, how many would enjoy good non-alcoholic beer if it existed? And like, I got the same complaints every time. And it was like, it, if the quality was there and if like the stigma wasn't there, people mm-hmm. would be excited about it. And I, so I kind of knew as we made true craft beer and we made it positive and aspirational that like it would just blow through those hurdles for people. And um, yeah, so I don't think I did a survey where it was less than 55% of people would drink the beer on a regular, at least a regular basis if it existed. And compared to like, non-alcoholic beer being 0.3% of the beer category. I was like, that is a huge gulf of people who are looking for a product that's not on the shelf. And it really was that. That first summer we put the beer on the trucks and um, we had such a supply shortage that like in Massachusetts, people would meet our beer distributors trucks in the parking lots at Whole Foods and Wegmans. And like there wasn't beer on the shelf for the whole summer because people were like getting to the beer buyer before it got out to the store. And, uh, so like, ironically, there was like a non-alcoholic beer shortage in the summer of 2019. which is pretty funny. <laughs> And that, that's really how most, if not, I don't know, you could argue maybe all kind of entrepreneurs, how, how good products are born. You it's out of necessity for yourself. You see, like you experience a problem yourself and you're like, God, this should be, there should be something, a better product here. There should be an easier way to do this. And then that's how it, you just, the idea is born essentially. So um, the, it, it is crazy how, how obvious it is looking back now, yeah. four years, but you, and, and the people were telling you that you should do it through these surveys, but it still took, you know, the convincing of investors to get it off the ground and prove out that there's, you know, a business behind it as well. So it, it's it's a very very interesting story to, uh, to me. You mentioned the uh, the stigma uh, kind of being like a, a roadblock to adoption. Uh, how much do you attribute the naming of athletic brewing to to addressing that? A lot. It was like super intentional to make sure it was something that was like universally positive, and you couldn't mm-hmm. like poke holes and like silo it. Like everyone's athletic in some way, be it like actually an elite athlete like you guys are like being like the best at Excel or video games or anything. And, yeah. um, and, uh, so yeah, we, we wanted to make it universally positive, not tied to like a locality or anything. And, um, I, yeah, I just had this like unwavering faith that like, I knew if it was something I felt good about and I wanted to drink 12 of these myself every week that like other Like, I just had to trust that that was like a normal human experience and a lot of people would relate to it. Yeah. What can you share with us any of the other names that you considered or that were maybe on your like (laughs) top 20 list or, or maybe on the bottom of the list that you were like (laughs) threw them out instantly. You're like, no way in hell that's going to be the name of this company. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's incredibly hard to find a name these days that's like trademarkable. Um, Cause like if anything's been used in any context before, it's like, out of 
uh, off the table. And um, Run Wild was actually one of our top names and it ended up being our flagship beer. Um, yeah. Uh, we definitely had so many for like, it must've been a full year, like any group dinner I was at or anything, I would like eventually steer the conversation towards like so naming. What we, yeah. What should we name? Yes. This? <laughs> and like my wife would be like, Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening again. And like, but like no matter who it was, I would like steer the conversation towards it eventually. So it took forever to name the company. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I noticed on the can too, non-alcoholic brews is trademarked, which is another nice, nice grab on your part as well. That's uh yeah. Oh, that's part of the whole like oh, it's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. Got know. it. Got yeah. it. Okay. That that would have been a nice one for sure. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> just just <laughs> I was wondering if it was like because non-alcoholic beers, I would assume not really possible to trademark, but the the brews word instead of non-alcoholic. For some reason I was thinking that was the the trademark. I was like, oh, that's a really good grab. <laughs> oh no, I wish. We do have a uh, beer for the modern adult and uh brew without compromise, which is right on the side there. Those are both, yeah, those yeah. are both good. And uh, I, I was actually, I, I was on the earlier today uh, talking about the upcoming NA Beer Mile on the Without Compromise podcast. So, um, oh, no so way. this is like a total athletic brewing day for me um, <laughs> <laughs> across the board. Thank so you is, so much. Great. <laughs> I'm um, really excited for the Beer Mile. This is like yeah. a truly elite event. Like I don't like it. It's like somewhat under the radar, but like this is, I I think could be huge too in the years to come as well. Like this year's event right. is so elite with you guys running it. And like, I, if like people stop to think about how fast a 430 beer mile is, um, <laughs> it is insane. Um, yeah. That's like about twice as fast as I go without the beers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's something that like Chris and I early on into the, the podcast or the, the website or the brand in general, we were like, it'd be really nice to get like a, an NA beer or just like a, a seltzer sponsor. And I, there was like one other that I, we were thinking about reaching out to and you're we like, no, we've got to like pull out for athletic, that's like <laughs> the cream of the crop. Um, but I, I feel like our kind of communities, the, the Venn diagram is very, very close to being a circle. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. So, so who originally came up with the idea on your side to do this NA beer mile? Was it you? Was it one of the team members? How did, how did this like idea come about a few, a few months back now, I guess it was. It's something we've been kicking around. Um, and we have a lot of good athletes on our team. Uh, Chris right. Bernard is the fastest short distance runner we actually have a really elite ultra runner on our team too jim sweeney who yep. he had uh like a top 300 mile race in the country in 2018 but um uh yeah chris and dermot and a few teammates were like this would be so much fun it's such a great intersection of our brand and like obviously you guys are the experts and elite of the sport um but it, it just felt too natural and too much fun and um, I can't wait to see it go down. I mean, it, it, that is so crazy fast. And um, I actually wanted to ask you about your other records too. Is the beer two mile eight beers? It is. It's eight <laughs> beers and eight laps. Yes. Wow. So it's That's more incredible. It's more in line with like an eating competition, I would yeah. say, than <laughs> than a beer mile. So it's it's one of those things that you do do once to get the record, and then like never never again do I ever intend well, to having, drink eight beers at one to, time. Having to like go for that again would be hard. It would be terrible. I don't even know if I could do it again at this point. I don't know if my my stomach would. It would just reject it. It'd be like, nope, not not again. I remember this terrible place that you put me into this app this one time. <laughs> that's amazing. I love your guys' website. I definitely <laughs> like that. There's a lot of good stuff. Um, yeah, and the Chunder Mile too. That's yeah. Wild. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> yeah. I always say that one's like sneaky hard because you don't realize how much more beer it is in the same distance. Like the beer two mile is kind of spread out. Yeah. But the Chunder Mile is like kind of, yeah. three and a three and a half more beers. Something yeah, like a it's lot. it's a lot more in one in one go. But but this this is why the NA Beer Mile is perfect though because like I so doing those races and getting those records, whatever, all these quirky events, like it's super fun to do those. But you really have to like time out when you're going to do it because yeah. it's like oh I'm literally going to drink six beers or eight beers tonight, like. 
I got to pick a time where it fits into my running training. I got to pick a time where it's not going to mess up my whatever work schedule, whatever it is. Right. And so it's really hard to do that. And then also like, you don't want to train for it. Cause I don't want to just go to the track and drink beers. Cause then it'll make my running worse. So having the NA beer, beer side of the, the sport, uh, makes it just so much more accessible. Like even people who do beer right. events, it makes it more accessible to not feel so bad about training for it, I guess you could say, and, and be comfortable doing it. But then also for new people that, you know, maybe have never tried a beer mile, it's a good way to introduce into it so that you're not, uh, you know, flooding your system with alcohol the first time you're doing it. And, you know, uh, still, still getting that like fun competitive atmosphere without, without compromise as, as the podcast is called. <laughs> That's crazy. Is there, in order to go faster, like I imagine a lot of people like listening to drinking four beers, like that's four minutes right there for a lot of people. Um, is there a shotgun element to it? Like, do you pierce the top of the can? <laughs> to, we, do go faster? Shotgun, we do have a shotgun mile on the site, but it's, it's a different category. Yeah. Yeah. They, all the official beer, beer mile rules are that you cannot alter the container in any way. So if you're using a bottle, you can't use a straw. If you're using a can, you can't like smash the can. You can't puncture the can. It's just, so it really, at this point, the beer mile really is it, as fast as you can pour it out of a can or a bottle. That's pretty much how fast the top guys can drink it. So then it really is just who's the fastest runner at this point. So um, like Corey Belmore is the, the fastest runner who can also drink all the beers as fast as it comes out of the bottle. Um, and that's why he has the world record. So there's, there's not a ton of room. I don't think in like increasing the beer mile speed, uh, as the rules stand, unless someone that's like a 350 miler happens to do it and happens to be able to chug four beers really quickly. But, um, but other categories like shot, shotgunning the, the beers or something else. I mean, there can be other rule variations that might be fun to play around with just to see, just to see how fast someone could do it with no rules at all. Like, a you know, could a 410 or a whatever happen and with, without any rules in place. I think with, uh, with the NA beer mile, we are actually poised to get a lot because we've, we've talked to like so many pros who would be like interested in it. But again, with like scheduling around the season to make sure yes. that it's like it's in the postseason and like before they start building base again, um, yeah. it's hard to schedule that. But I feel like with the NA beer mile and it's just like a little bit more accessible to, to people who are training at a high level mm -hmm. that it would give them like just enough nudge to, to actually do it. So I, I yeah. feel like times with, will get faster within a year yeah. of the NA beer. I mean, probably uh, later next, next week or a week after that, it'll probably yeah, be pe faster than the world record. Yeah. People, people will start uh, getting on the train of, Oh, I can, there's, there's a rule set that allows me to not have to drink the alcohol. So now it's okay to do. And it's not, yeah, it's not a bad brand image as well. If you're a pro athlete, you know, you don't necessarily want to, if you're a role, role model for a bunch of high schoolers, you don't necessarily want to be chugging for alcoholic beers either. So there's right. also that side of it that, you know, a lot of athletes worry about too. So. Yeah. I wonder if there's going to be on October 17th. I wonder if there'll be anyone in the field that kind of comes out of the blue and gives you guys a good challenge. Um, I hope so. I hope be so. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's a lot of yeah really good athletes lurking in our community for sure. It would be super cool. That would be, that would be great. Cause yeah, Corey, Corey and I have kind of just been battling it out for the last, like, well, I shouldn't say we've been battling it out. He's been beating me every time we race for the last like three years. Every but time he finishes. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. Every time, every time <laughs> one of us doesn't get DQ'd and we both finish, we, we've, it's really just been him and I battling it out for like the last three years. Um, so it, it would be awesome. I would love to see some new, new faces and especially for, uh, cause the beer mile itself has a, like a country component, USA versus Canada component too. So get some more Americans that are, that are good at the NA beer mile. That'd be awesome to see. I'd love to, yeah. Love to have some new faces in the crowd. Yeah. I could see this event building in years to come. Like I could definitely like see like the live play by play on the side and, Yep. could be really huge. Absolutely. We, I mean, we would love and part of the reason that we're in this area, I guess, is we do see like the entertainment aspect of it. And yeah, could, could you get to a point where your people are like betting on this, this, uh, these races and what I don't, I don't, whatever else, you know, there, there could be a lot around it, uh, to some extent, you know, yeah, whatever, whatever the law would allow us to, to do <laughs> there, but 
But uh, yeah, there, yeah, there's a good prize haul in a couple of weeks. Uh, there'll oh. be over two thousand dollars cash, bunch of different fleet feet gift certificates, Amazon gift cards, and all sorts of stuff. It's awesome. Uh, beer subscriptions and stuff. So so cool. A lot yeah. of different categories for people, so they don't feel like they have to run a four thirty mile to win something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so wait, so are you going to partake in this, or have you done a beer mile before in your life? I've definitely done beer miles, definitely slower. Like I'm much more of like, much more of like the dizzy bat versions of like, <laughs> or, or like more for fun. I, I'm definitely like, I can run forever, just not nearly at the speed you guys can run um, in short bursts. So um, I'll definitely be doing it at least virtually. Um, awesome. Hopefully I can be there in person. I might have to be on the West coast, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hopefully I would love to see you participate. It'd be, be fun to have you on board as well. And really, yeah, that would really make this event pop off in year one. It'd be really cool. Agreed. Yeah. (laughs) Darren Ravel will be there too. Um, Oh man. So yeah, it'll be fun. He's got, he's got upwards of 2 million Twitter followers. So I'm sure he'll be posting it out there. That's that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that that this will yeah, be a pretty this, big audience. This will be big. Yeah, I'm excited for it. So, so you mentioned you uh, run yourself. Is that your sport of choice? What what uh what are you into for fitness yourself? I mean, I'll honestly do anything, like um, anything from biking to like high intensity shorter workouts to long runs on the weekends. Like, I'd say on the weekends I usually run between like eight and fifteen miles for my long run. Um, I've done a bunch of ultra marathons and like anything from 30 miles to 50 K is 50 miles. And, um, but yeah, basically just love like putting my phone aside and like getting a sweat every day in some form. So I'm not elite in any regard, but like kind of love all sports and just like, like the meditative mindful elements of like a great workout are just like so key to the day. Yeah. It's funny you bring up the the phone aside piece of it. One that reminded me of one thing that I wanted to ask you about. So being a, you know, a, a trader for all those years and, you know, following financial markets, et cetera, like that's known to be a super stressful, um, time intensive, you know, energy intensive job. Would you say that that, like, is it more stressful to be like the CEO and running a company or was it more stressful to be in that position, you know, working, working that job, uh, just curious on, you know, for any aspiring entrepreneur out there, what the, what, what your experience has been, you know, going from, uh, you know, a pretty, I guess not, I don't want to say cushy because it's a lot of work, but like a, a safe, a safe job versus then taking on all the risk yourself in your own company. Yeah. Uh, so my old financial job was the hedge fund that the show billions was based around. Um, so it was like acutely stressful for sure. And yeah, it was a, it was a great job, but like definitely uh, intellectually challenging, super stressful any given day of the week and kind of draining in its own way a lot. Um, entrepreneurial, uh, ventures are definitely like, uh, I don't know, kind of like an interdisciplinary, like education every day. Like I learn something new every day and it's definitely not what I expected in the morning when I wake up and it's peaks and valleys every hour. Um, but it, it's definitely so much fun. Like, and, I could never see myself starting a company if I didn't hugely believe in what I was doing. Cause it is like totally exhausting. But like, if you're so into what you're doing, you can kind of like forget all that. And like, um, so I, I've been having a ton of fun and not once have I ever been like, Oh, I wish I like, maybe I should go back or like, it, yeah. it hasn't even like crossed my mind. So. Yeah. Yeah. I guess when you're doing, when you're doing what you love and it's, it's your own baby, I guess it's a, uh, it's a little bit different, even though you're spending more time on it than maybe a jo- other a different job. It's it's uh, all for fun and uh, something that you can watch grow. So I'm sure it's super fulfilling. For sure. And our, our team's awesome. So like any like stresses, we all go through together and like yeah. the community is awesome and kind of all feeds on itself. So Plus, Perfect. I'm a huge customer of our beers. I don't know what I would do if it <laughs> yeah, that's right you got to make it for yourself <laughs> uh, yeah. do you have like internal metrics of like uh reviews that you get like what's your uh internal quality control do you guys like have just running stuff that you kind of submit feedback oh, on or for sure like we ship beer back and forth all the time for sensory so that we're tasting beer on both coasts and it's identical mm-hmm. and um 
Yeah, we're kind of always doing quality and sensory and testing beer over three, six, nine months after we release it to the world. And so our brewing teams are incredible and like constantly iterating and getting better and better every year. Yeah. Perfect. Well, let's, we have a couple of kind of related, but kind of unrelated closing questions just uh, to finish up here. So um, let's go with this first one. So as a, as a former, you know, trader and I guess I don't know if you specialized in uh, like equities or currencies, yep. commodities, um, but get, are a lot of our listeners are kind of on the whole, you know, Wall Street bets, uh, you know, all that sort of craze of things. So yeah. do you have any do you have any stonk tips for for our listeners out <laughs> here to, to, to throw all their money into? <laughs> no specific stocks, but I would say like my biggest intellectual curiosity outside of athletic is like web 3.0 and cryptocurrencies and oh perfect so I, would, I would say i'm a big bitcoin maximalist okay uh, wow not, yes here we go not, <laughs> all right not, not necessarily a buy or sell recommendation i am like right. literally right. just portraying a, a thought right okay well here there we go that's uh that's in line. We, we talk about that a little bit on, on the podcast, not as much as I would like, I would love to talk about it a lot more, but, uh, but yeah, no, similarly, that's my, that's my, uh, I don't even know what you call it. The well that I've gotten into the last five years is, uh, getting into every single thing related to cryptocurrency, blockchain, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that's hey, at least, here. at least your well isn't red. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. You're, well, you're well into the black. <laughs> Um, okay. And here's another question out of left field for you. So tell us, uh, are we in a simulation? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, yeah. Almost undeniably. Yeah. Yeah. That okay. speaking of rabbit holes, I've gone way down that rabbit <laughs> hole. Like, that, yeah. Long car rides, podcasts, everything. Yeah. So. Perfect. Yeah. We, I, we heard you say that on the, um, on the, on the athletic podcast. And so, yeah, sim- similarly, I would say that we're kind of in that, uh, I'd realm, sell, yeah, similar me, interest areas. Sell me on the simulation but, aspect. You answered it really quickly. So you must have. <laughs> That's so funny. I can't believe I've said that out loud on the athletic podcast. I must've been like totally delirious. <laughs> uh, it, uh, well, I just like, as you look out, I saw someone on Twitter post the other day about like a new undiscovered web of galaxies that's a hundred billion light years wide for like us to think that we're the smartest beings in a galaxy, in like a web of galaxies, a hundred billion light years wide. That's full of billions of galaxies is like, there's, there's gotta be more going on than we can possibly grasp out there. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, we're we're both in that camp too. I think, or at least I know I am. <laughs> it hurts, it hurts my brain to think about. It. It's it it is very tough after to think about. after after working. Of course, that's a weekend thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> need some extra brain power. <laughs> yeah, to, to um to to think or blah, I can't think of uh, my words, but uh thinking thinking that uh we we know everything as humans is uh it's always funny when people use that as argument like there's no way that could be possible like science says or this says or that it's like we don't know we don't know so much stuff out there i'm i'm willing to admit that i don't know anything so uh yeah just, <laughs> yeah especially at this moment in time too that like the chances we at this moment are the most evolved life form if you look at us even like yeah. 50 years ago like the world has changed so much in that yeah. 50 years let alone their worlds out there that have been evolving for like millions of light years and everything. So, um, yeah. So my, one of my more recent YouTube polls is, uh, <laughs> Bell's incompleteness theorem, which is basically like math is incomplete. Uh, well, there's like three things where it's like, <laughs> uh, com- it's math is not decidable. So like, you can't just like get a problem and say whether or not you can solve it. It's incomplete in which uh basically means that it'll never be like done yeah and and at the very root of it are things that we accept as true without really having a reason for it it's really it's really trippy to (laughs) to think about to think about but yeah yeah Yeah, i totally like and things may be true in the perception of this moment, but like there will just be different viewpoints 10, 50 years in the future. And like the goal is to look back on yourself every year, five years, 10 years and be like, Oh, can't believe that's what I believed. You know, yeah. I really <laughs> right. I, like I'm so much smarter than, or I'm so much more evolved than I was at that point. There. 
Yeah. So when, when athletic brewing is IPO, it's worth a hundred billion dollars. What, what's your, what's your next investment then? What area are you, are you going into next from like, are you, are you going to space? Are you working? Like, well, like, where, I don't know. Like where, where are we, where's the next venture after athletic brewing takes over the world? <laughs> Are there investable space opportunities yet? I mean, space real estate seems like a no brainer, but like, yeah. also you could say like the supply is limitless too. So is that a good investment? It's a good um, point. What about like rather, and like real world investment in land seems like a great investment, but like, that's kind of the same bucket. What yeah. about digital real estate? Like if, like if you no longer have to travel around the world to experience everything and like just buy digital real estate where people will be hanging out in the future and build on that. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. Very true. It is. Um, I have a question that we're, we can retool. So typically we ask <laughs> athletes, um, you know, like who are runners, if you weren't a professional runner, like what would you most prefer to be a professional athlete in? what other sport? So for you, um, like in the beverage and food industry, if you weren't in NA beer, what uh, like category would you would you start a business in? Hmm. Is farming still in the food business? Oh, like, kind of farming, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Being like a yeah, and uh, like a vegan farm yep. would be amazing. Farm slash animal rescue. Yeah. My parents are very big into that. Yeah. that That's actually another, man, I feel like I get in a bunch of rabbit holes. That's another thing I've, <laughs> I've been listening to a lot of podcasts on lately. Um, like I listen to the, all the rich roll podcasts as well. And he'll often yeah. have people on there with like sustainable farming practices and all that. And so that's, yeah, that's another area that I haven't gotten as deep into the well and just as some of these other ones, but, uh, doesn't, uh but it, it is, it's super, super interesting, uh, and intriguing. And does just Waka Flocka have a farm? Five, maybe. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Just like the, I, I know it's some some professional rapper hasn't like stopped making music, but spends like six months a year out on a farm. Hey, smart man. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Bill, for coming on. Hopefully, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll see you here. This this episode's gonna come out in a couple of days. So maybe a week after this episode comes out, we'll see you at the NA Beer Mile. But if not, uh yeah, hope hope uh we'll we'll be excited to follow along with athletic brewing. And then we hope that this NA beer mile thing just just blows up and everyone hears about athletic and everyone here uh gets to watch some top athletes crush some uh, fast beer miles that have never done them before too. get the athletic uh, community involved in it. It'll be fun. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited for the beer mile and the first inaugural. And I think it's something we can build on for a lot of years in a row. So yeah, it's super fun to talk to you guys. Thank you so much for having me on.